All right. Hello, everyone. And good evening. Just starting my timer here. Good evening, and welcome to my talk about change data capturing with Debezium. I hope you enjoyed the conference so far. I bet it has been a long day, so I really appreciate you show up here. I know there's some tough competition at this slot, so really good to see you all here. So what is it you can expect in the coming 50 minutes? So I want to talk a bit about what is change data capturing to begin with, what it is about, and then what are some use cases where we can benefit from change data capturing. I will talk a bit about possibilities for creating data streams of changes. And finally, I will talk about Debezium, which is a tool for doing exactly this. And I will show Debezium uh, in a small demo, which I've prepared. Let me <coughs> sorry, introduce myself. I work as a software engineer at Red Hat. And nowadays, I am fully focused on Debezium. So I took over the project lead of this a couple of months ago. Before that, I worked as the spec lead for Bean Validation 2.0. So I worked with a expert group of interested people on a new revision of the Bean Validation spec. And as it happens, there is a quickie tomorrow at the lunch break. So if you would like to know more about Bean Validation 2.0, I would like to invite you for that quickie tomorrow. And another side project I'm working on is Mapstruct, which is a code generator for bean to bean mappings. And I'm doing another quickie also tomorrow noon. So two of these quickies right after each other. All right, so if there are any questions during the talk, please feel free to ask them. You just might have to shout because I might not be able to see you easily due to the lights. All right, so what is change data capturing about? Um, Generally, the idea is this. So you have your data in your database, obviously, and now you create a stream of events which represent all the changes to tables within this database. So for all the inserts, all the updates, all the deletes, one corresponding event representing this change will be emitted and be made available to consumers of such a stream. And um, here in this uh, picture, I'm showing Apache Kafka as some means of having a messaging infrastructure for them, but it's not implicitly tied to Apache Kafka. So Debezium is based on Kafka at this point, so that's what we are using, but the change data capturing concept itself, it's nothing which would be specific to uh, Kafka necessarily. Um, right, and what, what could we do if we have this stream of change events? So all the inserts, all the updates, all the deletes, we have events for that. So what could we do with such a data stream? And well, the first thing would be just we could replicate data to other systems, to other databases. So it might be just some means of backing up your data, propagating it to, into a replica, essentially. But it also could enable um, many interesting analytics use cases. So you might have your production database. Let's say it's MySQL or Postgres. And then you have this cluster of Apache Spark or Flink, or maybe it's Hadoop, whatever, Teradata, perhaps. So you have those dedicated analytics systems. And you would like to run analytics workloads there. Well, you need to get your data from the production system, from the productive database into those other systems. And again, such a change data capturing stream will enable you to do this. Or you could think about feeding data to other teams. So let's say you work on this um, ordering um, order management application. And now your marketing team in your company, they would like to run a specific ad campaign or a specific marketing campaign where they would like to target users which maybe have ordered a specific product in the past. And so, of course, they need to find out about those um, customers who ordered a specific product. And well, you don't want the marketing folks to run those kind of queries in your production database, but instead they should be doing it in a separate database. So again, a change or a CDC stream could be useful to just propagate your data changes to the marketing folks, their database, and then they can run whatever queries you want there. So that's replication in the widest sense. Another very interesting use case for CDC is um, microservice architectures. And where you have different services, or you, you have essentially cut down your domain into different services. And again, well, those services, they will very likely need to interact with each other. And so the example here would be um, you have three services, like an ordering application. So this manages, with, manages customers, customer orders. You have another microservice, which deals with the item catalog and the products which, which you are selling. And finally, a third service, which keeps track of the stock, so how many items 
do you have for a specific article? And let's say th those are these three microservices. And now, if a customer goes to the order application, well, very likely this application will need data from the item system and it will need data from the stock system to pr um, fulfill its um, purposes, right? So the customer, they need to be able to understand, is there any stock of this item available? What's the item description and so on? And the question is, how could you do this? And well, the first idea, of course, would be that the order system talks to the other two systems and it calls, uh, let's say, REST APIs. And this could work, sure, but it ties those three systems very closely together. So if the stock system goes away, then these REST requests couldn't be uh, executed and the ordering system would be affected, right? So and some people call this actually not a system of microservices, but it's more like a distributed monolith because those services are so closely linked together. Um, so that's not a good idea. What else could we do? Well, we could again use CDC. And the idea here would be that the item system and the stock system, they pro provide a change data stream with all the item changes. So whenever a product changes its disc description or the stock system, it provides a data stream whenever the stock count of an item changes. And then the ordering system could come and subscribe to these streams and create a copy of this data, or maybe just a copy of the subset of this data, which it is interested in, in its own local database. And then if essentially, if those other systems will go away for some time, still the ordering system would be able to fulfill its purpose and it would function. It might, be, uh, might fall a bit behind, perhaps uh, the stock system is just unreachable, but still its state changes. So the ordering system might fall behind, but still it can work and it is not linked directly to the uptime of the stock or the item system. So that's how you could use CDC to propagate data in microservice architectures. And finally, so this talks a bit about, um, well, linking or propagating data changes and streams thereof between different systems, but actually CDC also could be very useful if you just think about a single system. So let's say you have your data in a MySQL database again, and then you have this cache of data which you use to satisfy um, specific queries or specific lookups very, very quickly. So you need to update this cache, of course, and whenever the data changes, this cache must be updated or it must be invalidated either way. Um, but those two things need to be kept in sync. Or you could think about full text search. So very often you would like to be able to uh, to provide the user with powerful search functionality so they can search with um, wildcard operators and proximity and so on. And usually databases are not so good to do this. And instead you would use something like Solar or Elasticsearch for those full text search functionalities. And again, the Elasticsearch or the Solar index, it must be kept in sync with your primary database. Um, and the last very interesting use case is CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So this means um, you work with one data model where you just apply your rights to and then you would have different multiple data models which are optimized to satisfy specific read use cases and of course those read models they need to be updated whenever this write model changes and again the, the cdc f um, or cdc could be useful to implement this um okay so i hope I could establish that CDC can be uh, very useful and it enables lots of interesting use cases. And now the question, of course, is how could we do this? How could we get hold or how could we achieve it to have such a data stream of data changes? And the first uh, idea you could have is, well, my application, which changes its data in its, in its database, it also could go, if you think about this last example, it also could go to the cache and it could update the cache. And it could also go to the full text search index to update the stuff there. And this might um, work if all goes good, but actually there are some, some problems with that. For once, it's very invasive for your application, right? So this application it needs now to know that there are all these other things which I need to think about and which I need to keep in sync. So this is very um, intrusive into your application architecture. And the probably the bigger problem is um, it's very hard, if not impossible, to do this in a reliable way because mostly those things are not part in what we would call like distributed transaction. So if you think about Elasticsearch, there's no way this could be part in a distributed transaction with your database, which means it always could happen that if there are concurrent writes going on, that the data in the full text search index ends up in another state than it is in the primary database. And just to give an example, 
So let's say there are two concurrent requests in your application, which both affect the same customer. Let's say its address gets changed. And now out of this, in such a dual write approach, as it's called, we would emit two write requests to the full text search server. Um, but due to the nature of this HTTP protocol, you're not in control how quickly those requests would be processed. So it might be that actually the full text, the request to Elasticsearch, which was emitted for the first data change, it arrives only second at the uh, um, full text search server and the other request arrives there first, meaning the data in your full text search service um, drifts off the um, data and its state in the primary database. So this is something which you need to be aware of. You, need, uh, you would need to think about how you can compensate for that by running some batches. And essentially, it's not the best idea to do it. Next idea could be polling. So you could have some means of just going to, the, to your database and frequently you know, poll for updates. Um, obviously, this creates some sort of conflict between how often do you do this and um, so how current is the data. Um, and the performance hit which this gives you, right? So you could ask every half a second, but this will probably have quite a severe load impact on the database. So it's not something you would do too often. And also the question is, of course, how do you actually find the changed rows? So um, usually you would need to have, let's say, some update flag in such a table so you know when it has been changed for the last time. So it, this affects your data model in the database, right? So this is um, something which is not uh, something you might even be able to do depending on you. Um, on your setup. And finally, the uh, question is, how would you deal with deleted rows? So if I poll, if I go to a table and ask for the rows, well, I won't be able to learn about any rows which have been deleted because, well, I just can't create for them. So that's essentially not really possible. OK, so those approaches um, are not good. So what else could we do? And well, the idea really is that we access and query what is called the database log file. And essentially, all the databases, they have either a trans transaction log or a replication log. And this file you could imagine as a log of all the transactions which have been executed successfully in the system and which are in a serialized form. So they are um, in ordered, in, uh, um, essentially. And now by going to this database log and essentially tailing it, you can get hold of all those change events and all this information you need in a way which is fully transparent to the applications which write this data, right? So they are not affected by this at all. You just can, you essentially connect to the database and you get hold of this um, log and you query it. Um, Right, so and uh, usually, so those logs are either used for transaction um, compensation. So let's say some um, a system or the database goes away in the course of a transaction, when it comes back up again, the system will be able to find out about this by examining this log file and then undoing all the trans uh, sorry, all the transactions which uh, haven't been committed yet. So they can um, get the system can get rid of those. Or the other use case for this is replication. So between a master node of the database and slave nodes, um, this replication log will be used to transmit to apply all the changes to those secondary nodes. So essentially, you could also think about this from a conceptual point of view, just acting as another slave in such a replicated um, structure. And we act as a slave and retrieve all the changes through the replication mechanism. Uh, and all those databases, they have this kind of logs. So in MySQL, it's called the bin log. In Postgres, we have the write ahead log. In MongoDB, it's the ob log. And all the databases have this. Unfortunately, there is no standardized way to access these logs. So for us, as the developers of Debezium, it means we need to understand about this, those APIs. Is there an API uh, to begin with? And yes, if yes, how is this API structured? How can we do it? But then, but then for you, as a consumer of Debezium, this is largely transparent, so that's, that's our job. And the idea really is, let's use those log files to implement CDC. All right, so we know now how we can get hold of change information. And in the beginning, I, I mentioned, well, there will be some sort of messaging infrastructure in such a CDC uh, design. And um, we are using Apache Kafka, or Debezium is based on Kafka. And um, this is because Kafka has some very interesting semantics, which are which make it a very good fit for the purposes of CDC. Um, so I'm not going to give the full introduction to Kafka. Um, I guess you have heard it in other talks. But let me talk a bit about some of those uh, semantics which Kafka gives us, which are so useful for our purposes. And the first one is all the messages in Kafka, they have a key and a value. And this means we, for instance, can 
query essentially for all the messages which uh, share the same key. And this very nicely maps to our CDC use case because we can structure the key of a message based on the primary key of the table which our change stream is about. So if the primary key of the table just has a single column, well, then this message key, it would be just like a single long or a single string or whatever. Or if you had a comp composite primary key, well, then this message key in Kafka it would also be a complex structure. And then the value of the message, we will see that in a bit, it will represent the actual change. So that's the first thing, messages have a key. Then the next thing, which is very important, there is a guaranteed ordering. So Kafka guarantees or gives us guarantees that if a message has been submitted to Kafka before another message, then we consumers will get this first message first. So this applies within a single partition, I get to that. But that's very vital for our use case, because if you think about two events, one for an insert in a database and another event for an update, of course, consumers need to see that insert event first. So it must not happen that the update event overtakes the first one. Or if you think about two updates, well, you need to see them in order in uh, so you are able to achieve or to arrive at the final, proper final state. It is pull-based, meaning consumers themselves, they are in charge of um, keeping track of how far have they read this uh, particular topic or where, they would, where would they like to start. So a consumer it might just be interested in um, you know, following changes going on from now on. It isn't interested in changes from the past, but another consumer might be interested in the entire history of data changes of a given table, and it, it itself is in control when uh, should it start to read this, this topic. There's uh, this feature of log compaction, which means, um, well, we have, if, if you think about tables which have records which change very, very often, um, where we would see very many uh, CDC events in, in the corresponding Kafka topic, and this might be a problem at some point. And now the log compaction feature in Kafka means that all the messages which belong to the same key, all of them will be removed except the last one. So this means, um, just the last message pertaining to a specific record in our database, it will be kept around, and this will still allow consumers to read the current state of this particular record. It won't have access to the entire history anymore, but still at least it has access to the current state. And depending on the use case, this might be a good thing or not, but it's, it's a useful option to have. And finally, it scales well. So I mentioned uh, there might be very many events, and Kafka allows us to scale, so topics can be partitioned and uh, sharded across nodes. Um, and again, that's, that, that's helpful to deal with, with, with such a big load, of course. We just need to keep in mind that the ordering of messages is just guaranteed for a specific partition. So if I have a topic with change events, um, and this topic is uh, distributed about multiple nodes, the order is just guaranteed within those specific partitions. And all the events which belong to the same key, they will go to the same partition, so I would still have the guarantee for the events which belong to one key, but I would not have a guarantee for the order of messages, let's say, for all the events which belong to one table, but depending again on the use case, it might be needed or not. So that's, that's Kafka, um, and I think it, it should be clear it's very useful for our purposes, and now we actually could go and implement this CDC functionality on plain Kafka. But there is another very useful thing in the Kafka ecosystem, which is called Kafka Connect. And Kafka Connect is essentially a framework which makes it a bit easier for us to implement um, data connectors. And data connectors, they are either in charge of getting data into Kafka, or they are in charge of getting data out of Kafka. And so they are called source and sync connectors. And our CDC connectors, um, of course, they are source connectors. So they, they deal with getting data into Kafka. Um, and I have a framework, or there is a framework provided for me, which makes it, or which gives me some structure if I would like to impl implement such a connector, so that's good. But it also deals with the offsets. Um, and this means, well, if, if our connector, it reads the, micro, the MySQL bin log, um, it will read um, always um, the events uh, from specific positions, right? And it could happen that my connector goes away, and when it st is started up again, it needs to know, okay, how far have I read the bin log at the last time, and I need to read on from there on, right? And um, Kafka Connect is helping with that, so every now and then it will 
go to the connector and essentially commit the offset, which has been processed so far. And if my connector is restarted, I can ex um, access this previous offset and read again from there. So this means I might have committed an offset from a couple of events ago, so I would read the bin log or I would read certain sections of the bin log uh, a second time, meaning my consumers will receive the same change events another time. But that's something which you usually need to handle or need to be able to handle in Kafka anyway. So it's always mostly deliver at least once semantics you have there. You might see some events more than once. There is support for schemas, meaning um, Kafka Connect comes with some type system and a way which allows to me to describe the structure of my keys and my values of my messages so I could make sense out of, of, out of those messages later on. Again, it's clustered, so Kafka Connect could be clustered depending on the specifics of my um, connector. It might make sense to distribute it and have its tasks work being processed on several nodes or not. And the very nice thing is it's, it, there's a rich ecosystem of connectors. So if you go to, uh, go to the Confluent website on Kafka Connect, you will see lots of connectors being listed there. Um, there are many, many connectors. Let's say for, uh, there's one for Elasticsearch and for all the databases, there are source connectors, sync connectors, and so on. All right, that's Kafka Connect. And now let's take a look how would such a CDC pipeline look like. So let's say I would like to stream the changes from those two databases here, my MySQL and my Postgres database. So the first thing I need is a Apache Kafka cluster. So it, I might have one already running or I might start up a new one, but that's the first thing I need. Then the next thing would be Kafka Connect. So that is a separate cluster, separate processes, separate from Kafka itself. Um, and Kafka Connect will manage those connectors for me. And finally, I need to deploy those connectors into Kafka Connect. So there is a Debezium connector for MySQL, there is a Debezium connector for Postgres, and I need to deploy an instance of those connectors into Kafka Connect. It will start them up and they will begin and f read the bin log from MySQL, read the uh, write ahead log from Postgres, and create corresponding change events in Kafka. And of course, I would not I don't need those events in, in Kafka for their own sake. I would like to use, or I would like to do something with them. And this means I will configure at least one sync connector, which then is subscribed to these topics and which emits the data into some other system. So here it's the Elasticsearch um, sync connector, meaning those three tables, which we are monitoring here. And uh, so we have those three topics, all the changes will be reflected in corresponding Elasticsearch documents. Um, so I have spoken a bit about the messages and I mentioned they have a key and a value. So let's take a closer look. So I already spoke about the key. So this is resembling the structure of the primary key of our table, um, which we are monitoring or tables. So there would be a specific message type per table, of course, um, and the value is a complex structure which um, comprises of the following parts. So there's um, a before and an after state. So in case we transmit an update event, this is very clear. So the before part of the payload, it would re represent the old state of this changed data row and the after state, it would represent the new state of this changed row. For an insert, the before would be empty because there is no before. And for a delete event, well, the after would be empty because the record is deleted. So there's no such thing such an after state. There is uh, some source information about this, so some, some metadata about the origin of this change. So this is like information about the database server, the position in the bin log, um, th some, some, um, the name of the table where this event is coming from, some time stamp, and so on. And so that's, that's the log logical structure of these messages. And this is independent from the, let's say, physical structure on the transport layer. So uh, Kafka essentially deals just with any kind of binary data in its messages, so it doesn't care about this. And what I have here, uh, if I'm in the Kafka Connect ecosystem, I have this notion of um, a message converter. And message converters deals with, or deal with, well, creating the representation which is transmitted um, for those messages. And there is uh, coming already with Kafka Connect, there is a JSON connector. So this will um, give us the representation we see here on the right side. So this is JSON. And for that one, I optionally have the um, opportunity to include the schema of the data within each and every message. So this schema uh, would be uh, 
a description of the types of the before and the after state and um, consumers could then use this schema to make, you know, to, to interpr interpret this data accordingly. Of course, this is quite verbose. Um, JSON itself isn't super efficient, but it's human readable. So this might be a nice thing for, uh, during development. For instance, what I um, notice when people talk about their production purposes, usually they use this other converter which is coming with connect and this is the Evro converter. So this is a very efficient and compact binary representation. So you cannot really look at the message and make sense out of it. It just contains binary uh, the binary uh, representation of the data. And importantly, there is no schema information within the messages themselves. There's just an ID of a schema and the schema version. And this can be resolved using the schema registry, which is another part of this uh, Kafka ecosystem. So the schema registry just deals with schemas and their versions. And if I, as a consumer, take this version identifier I get from a message, I can make sense out of this binary data by getting the schema from the registry and interpreting the binary stream accordingly. All right, so um, that's with that, I got everything in place. So I got uh, a source for my CDC events. I got Kafka as a very powerful messaging infrastructure with very useful semantics. I have Kafka Connect as this uh, framework for implementing those connectors. Um, the final thing which is missing is, um, is this. Uh, so if I go to the database, and let's say this database I would like to capture changes from, it has been running for a long time. So it might happen that I go to the bin log or to its transaction log, and this actually does not contain all the information about all the changes anymore. Because if, let's say, this is the replication log from, from um, uh, Postgres, and the data has been replicated, well, it, the database can just get rid of this replication log. It doesn't need it anymore. And of course, you can configure this, but at some point, those uh, files may go away, meaning I cannot get all the information I need out of those change logs. And the solution for this is um, DBZM can do an initial snapshot for you. So this means it goes to the, to the tables you're interested in, essentially scans them, and emits ch um, events for all the records in such a table. So essentially, an insert event would be created and sent to Kafka for the tables which we are interested in. And then, if the snapshot is done, well, we, of course, can fall over to reading the bin log right after the point where this snapshot has been taken. So that's not, um, that's qu quite, quite tricky to implement, I would say, but for you, you don't really notice this. You just see in the monitoring of the connector, you would see, okay, the snapshot is going on. Uh, at some point, the snapshot is done, and it's going over to the log reading mode, but this is essentially transparent for, for you and for the consumers. All right, so uh, what, what connectors do we have? I already mentioned MySQL and Postgres. There is another one for MongoDB. Um, this one is a bit special because, well, MongoDB is a bit different than the other databases. So for once, there is not the notion of a strict or fixed schema, so that's not something you would have there. But most importantly, changes are also represented a bit differently. So essentially what we get from the MongoDB oblog is some kind of patch format in, in MongoDB's own notation which describes such a change. So the CDC events for MongoDB, they would have contain this um, patch format, whereas for MySQL and Postgres, they will look essentially like the rows, like the entire rows. Um, we are working on other connectors, so the next one would be Oracle. Uh, SQL Server might be very possible and, and some others. So this really is depending a bit on the feedback we get from, from users like you or from people interested. Um, what are databases you are using and what connectors would you like us to add? And if, well, if we hear, for instance, Oracle, I've been asked about this very often, many times, well, so I make some kind of judgment, okay, this could be a good thing to have. MariaDB, uh, we would like to add this, and you might think, okay, that should be just very easy because it's essentially the same as MySQL. The problem here is that the bin log format in MariaDB has diverged a bit from the one which is used by MySQL, and we use a library for reading this bin log, and this library does not yet support MariaDB, so we are a bit um, well in a tough spot here, so we need to decide, okay, should we fork this library, should we create our own, or sh can we you know, enhance it and contribute back? So that's the, the th decision to make. Um, right, and we try to work with the same or with uh, the same messaging formats across those connectors, MongoDB being a bit the exception, as I mentioned. We also try to have common options, so there are options for filters, which are the databases or the tables you would like to monitor. Um, 
how would you like to deal with snapshots? Would you not like any snapshot at all? Are you fine if you just get changes from here on? Or would um, you do a snapshot once off and never again and this kind of thing? And there also is monitoring via JMX. So um, Kafka Connect comes with its um, REST API for monitoring connectors, but this is very cross grain Essentially, you see, OK, the connector is running or not running, whereas here, this JMX-based monitoring, it gives you some more insight into the connectors. So for instance, if a snapshot is running, it will tell you how far is this, um, has this snapshot proceeded. Or another very interesting metric is, is how far are we behind, be, um, behind the bin log or the, the uh, data log in the database. So the transaction log, it will usually give us some sort of timestamp, and we compare, can compare this uh, um, to the current time, so we know how far we are behind. So that's some useful information to work with. Um, all right, and with that, I would like to show this a bit in practice. Um, are there any questions so far before I do that? Yeah? I do have a question. It's my SQL specific. Uh -huh. I was wondering, last time I checked, updates on my SQL in the bin log, they mm. don't Okay, so the question is, in the bin log of MySQL, um, do events representing updates, do they tell you the before state? And um, there are different modes for the bin log, and if you are working with the row uh, mode, you will get the before state. So our change events are able to expose this. Okay, um, so let me go to the demo, and I have prepared for that, I have prepared a little web application, and this is just your regular CRUD application, and it deals with managing hikes. So you could order hikes, um, subscribe to hikes, and so on. And um, just to show you that it's working, let me create a new hike. So let's say I hiked from Hamburg, where I live, to Antwerp. I see it here, I can search for hikes, and so on. And this is based, um, it's a Java EE application, it's based on um, Wildfly, and it's using MySQL underneath. So MySQL of um, is already running here. So the next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to fire up Kafka, Kafka Connect, and all the bits I'm, I'm, I'm needing for this. And I'm using this doing, doing Docker, so I have a Docker Compose file. Um, so this takes a bit. Just let me show you the file, the Compose file. Sorry. Um, so I have services configured here for Zookeeper, which is needed to administer the cluster um, Kafka. Um, MySQL, that one has already started before. Postgres, which I will use in a bit as a downstream target for my changes. I have started the schema registry, so I will work with the Avro message format here. So I need a registry and, um, yeah, and of course Kafka Connect, and then there's some configuration in Kafka Connect. So let's say here the key and the value converter. So here I'm saying, okay, this Connect instance, it should use the Avro converter and not uh, the JSON converter. Okay. Um, I hope everything is up. Let me check. Okay, this looks good so far. By the way, the font, it's big enough, right? You can read it. Okay, that's cool. Um, right, so I have started now Kafka, Kafka Connect. The next thing I need to do is I need to deploy the Debezium connector. And for that, I use this um, endpoint of the, um, of the local, uh, sorry, of the Kafka Connect node, so uh, this is a REST API, and I post this JSON document to it for configuring this connector. So let's do that. And if all goes well, it gives me back um, the description of this connector, so we can take a, a quick look. So it uses the MySQL connector provided by the Debezium project. It uses a specific host name and password and some uh, port and so on, so it knows where to connect to. It has a whitelist, so this is the databases within this MySQL uh, process I'm interested in. Um, and that, yeah, that's, pr that's pretty much what's interesting for us. So the connector should be running. So let's see, uh, I, I just used the status API from Kafka Connect. Okay, it's, it's running, that's good. So I should be able to see some events. So what should have happened now is that the, the connector came up and it took an initial snapshot of this hike table, which this is um, about. So I can start now this tool, which is called the console consumer, which is coming with Kafka, and it allows me just to look into some, some topics. So I'm using here the Avro console consumer because I'm using Avro as a message format. 
I say um, where is the schema registry because it needs that to make sense out of the binary data. And most importantly, I say which to topic it should connect to. So that's the uh, topic name which is used here by a Debezium connector. So it's DB01 inventory hike. It's comprised out of the uh, some database identifier out of the uh, um, schema name essentially, and then the name of table hike. So I will run this one. Um, and indeed, I'm getting this uh, uh, data here, which uh, was expected, of course. And so this is rendered here as JSON, but um, actually the data is Evro. So this is just a visual visualization here for us to read. And um, well, we have a key here with the primary key of the records. We have the before state, which is null because the initial snapshot it just will emit the insert events. The after state um, is pretty much what we expect. So it's destination and verb. It's the start um, Hamburg, and then in the source element, I got this metadata, which which I mentioned. So let me go back to the application. Oh, sorry. Go back to the application. Let me create a new hike. So let's say I came from Berlin and went to Amsterdam. Um, and quite quickly, I see this one coming up here. Let me also do an update. So let me change this. And now in this um, update event, now I see here the before state with the old destination and I see the after state with the new destination. By the way, if someone knows the Afro console consumer and can tell me how I could nicely format this, um, I would be very happy to learn about. Okay, um, right, and I can do a delete. Let me do a delete for you. So let me remove the last one. And here I'm getting actually two events that's interesting. So I get the, the one with the before state, which is the old state of the row, after is null. And then I get another event for the same key with a null payload, which is called a tombstone event, which essentially allows us to get rid of this um, message eventually. So it could be removed from the queue if that's needed. Okay, so uh, let me also show you a bit the schema registry. So this is... Um, also exposing a REST API, and here I'm asking now for the subject with this name uh, db01 inventory hike value, so I'm interested in the value schema, and in version 1. And we can take a look at this, and this describes the schema for us. Um, what can we see? So, for instance, the before structure is described here, and this has all the fields which are the columns in this table which we have been monitoring, so destination, start, and so on. Okay, so that's that's pretty nice. Um, let me mention, or let me go back to the slides and uh, discuss one more thing, and this is message transformations. Um, so Kafka Connect also comes with a way for transforming messages. Um, it's called single message transforms, SMTs. And those um, SMTs, they, for instance, allow me to extract information from a data, from, from a message. So I just can take a part out of a message and propagate this, or I could convert parts of the message. So let's say I get a message which has a timestamp using uh, micros or seconds or milliseconds, whatever, since epoch, and I would like to convert this into a nicely readable string. Such a message converter, or such a transformation could do this. Or I could use this for routing, so I can influence the topic where a message goes to. And those um, SMTs, they could be, or they can be applied either on the source side or on the, within a source connector or within a sync connector. So you would do this in a sync connector if you would like to the message to be altered before they ever show up in the topic. Then you would have this transformation in this uh, on, the, on the source side. Whereas if it's a transformation which you would just like to apply for a single specific consumer, then you would apply it uh, for this specific sync consumer. There are a couple of uh, SMTs which come with Debezium. And the one is the what we call the logical table router. And this lets you influence to which topic a specific change message is routed to. And the use case, or one good use case for this is if I deal with sharded data. So let's say I have my customer data, I have many, many customers, so in my MySQL database, I have sharded it across five tables. And by default, there would be a topic for each of those five tables, but probably I would like to have one large topic which contains all the changes for all the customers from those five shards. So I can use this SMT to route all those events into a single topic and then I also could amend the primary key to include, for instance, a shard identifier. And the other one which I'm going to show here is the event flattening SMT. And this takes 
just the after state of an event and um, pushes this forward. And the reason for this being many of the connectors which are there, they don't expect such a complexly structured CDC event, but they just expect a flat event which essentially represents a single row. It essentially would expect just what we have as the after state in our um, CDC event. So this SMT, it will just take this after part and propagate it. Um, okay. And for that, I have, uh, um, I will show you a consumer and I already started uh, Postgres here. Um, so I, I'm using now here the Postgres client and I just ask, give me please everything from this table which should contain the hikes. So I can do it and nothing is there. So this table doesn't even exist, which makes sense because we have not set up the sync connector for Postgres yet. So let me do that. Um, so again, I'm using this API to now post this connector. Um, this is now using the JDBC sync connector, which is provided by Confluent. Um, it has this connection URL, it has this topic. So this is subscribed to the DBC01 inventory hike topic. And it's applying this transformation of this unwrap from envelope type, which we provide. And this makes sure it just takes the after state from the CDC events. So if I go to Postgres again, now I should see um, this table. So it, ha it has been created and it just contains the data as it also is uh, existing in my primary database. So let me go to the application again. Let me create a new one. <coughs> Let's say I came from Berlin and hiked to London. And now if I go back to Postgres and create again, I see this latest event there or this latest record there. So this works. And now the very nice thing about um, uh, Kafka and Kafka Connect and basing CDC on this is it gets very manageable for us uh, to deal with failures. So let's say Kafka Connect isn't available for some reason. So let me take down, um, sorry, um, let me take down the Connect service. So this means the source connector won't be um, listening to MySQL anymore. Um, so I can apply, s oh sorry, I can apply some more changes. So let me create another hike. Let's say from New York to Newcastle. And let's create one more from Fossils to Antwerp. And now if I go uh, to my Postgres database, I, I won't see these latest changes, right? Because Kafka Connect isn't there, so it's no surprise uh, that, that, that nothing is happening. But if I start it up again now, so that's what I mean. So the data, we can fall behind, but it still is consistent to, uh, to this specific point. So let me start up Kafka Connect again, and this will then start up the uh, DBZ connectors, and they will continue to read the bin log after the point which had been committed last, right? And it, if it might even uh, be the case that this connector had been down for a very long time, so the bin log uh, isn't giving us enough information, so then it could be configured in a way that it actually would start and take a full snapshot again. Um, okay, so this should be all right. So let's see whether the stuff is there. And, and indeed, now the connectors have kept okay, um, caught up again, and we see those changes which had been applied while Kafka Connect wasn't actually running. So that's that's quite nice, I would say. Okay, um, right. So to try it out yourself, um, as you've seen, this is uh, we provide Docker images for everything, uh, which are deployed to Docker Hub. So you can go there, you can get, for instance, a Connect image, which contains the Debezium connectors, and this makes it quite easy for you to get started. So we also have those um, Compose files, or some Compose files, which essentially let you do what you've seen just here um, yourself if you have a Docker installed. There is an extensive tutorial, so this walks you through the setup and describes very specific messages and their format and so on. And finally, we have instructions for OpenShift. So if you are running your stuff um, or your applications on OpenShift, uh, we have um, instructions for that and we also um, provide uh, yeah, templates for that essentially. So there's the Almas project from Red Hat, which uh, works or which works towards messaging as a service. And one thing they are doing is they provide very good um, templates for running Kafka and OpenShift and Visium is based on that. Um, in terms of 
where are we uh, um, with releases? So currently, the current version is um, 0.6.1. There will be one or more um, um, micro-releases for that, for sure. The next one will be out this week, likely. Then the next um, minor will be 0 0.7, which will move to Kafka 1.0, which you might have learned or noticed that they went to 1.0 recently. And most importantly, this will enable to run Debezium on Postgres on Amazon RDS. So for um, to give some background there, on Postgres, we need a server-side plugin, which is called a logical decoding plugin. And on Amazon RDS, we are not really in control what are the logical decoding plugins which exist there. But they just recently added one, which is essentially um, emitting JSON messages. So we are working now with this logical decoding plugin, which lets you use Debezium with Postgres and RDS. RDS. There will be further 0.x releases with new connectors. So as I said, hopefully Oracle being the next one. We might add support for InfiniSpan, which is this um, data uh, grid uh, um, or key value store, you could say, by, uh, by JBoss. And we're going after Debezium 1.0. We might, uh, well, sh there might be further connectors, but one thing which we have in mind is we would like to support you with creating, um, of with event aggregation. This means, so those CDC events, they currently relate to specific tables. So you will get, let's say you have orders and order lines, the CDC events, you will have CDC event for orders and for all the lines. And very often, for instance, if you talk to Elasticsearch, you would like to create an aggregated event which contains an order and all the other lines in a consistent state. And so we have some ideas how we could provide you with some tools and some um, building blocks so you could quite eas easily achieve such an aggregated event. Um, with that, I'm almost done. So to wrap it up, um, Debezium brings you change data capturing for a number of, um, for a growing number of databases. Um, what I find very useful, very interesting about it, it's very, uh, it is transparently in terms of setting this up. So you don't need to alter your source applications. As you, as you saw, I was running this hike manager application and I didn't have to touch it. I just could set up Debezium and it would talk to the database and um, capture the events from there. Um, the database, it must, uh, it may uh, um, require some sorts of configuration, as I should admit, or I should say that, but the application, the upstream application, it, it's not affected. As we've seen, this works kind of reli or very reliable in, uh, in failure situations, so if single components aren't there, um, well, the consumers, they may fall behind a bit, but still, they will catch up eventually and data is always consistent. Whereas if you think about this dual write approach, you might end up in a state where your full text search index doesn't represent uh, the same data or it just represents some wrong data, uh, which is not something which you would um, want. It's everything It's open source. It's on GitHub. Um, so you can go to github.com uh, Debezium and um, just catch the source code there. The website, debezium.io. And yeah, we would be very happy to learn about your requirements for that, or even better, if you would like to contribute, that would be great. And finally, there's the Divisium Twitter account, so if you would like to follow up on the news, releases, and so on, um, that's the account to subscribe to. And with that, there's some time left for questions. <coughs> Anyone with questions? So that's always, um, that's, it could be a good sign or a bad sign either. <laughs> Um, everything is clear or nothing is clear, you, and you don't dare to ask. Anyways, um, otherwise, feel just free, f free to come to me afterwards, and we can have a more informal discussion. Thank you so much.